For all of us, it's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I've got Matt Eisenacher. Matt is the chief brand officer at First Watch Restaurant Group. He joined First Watch in 2019 as the senior vice president of brand strategy and innovation before taking on the role of chief brand officer in 2023. Previously, Matt was chief concept officer for Paeta Italian Street Food. Prior to that, Matt spent over 12 years in the consumer packaged goods industry across a variety of food and nutrition brands working for Nestle USA. And previously to that, Price Waterhouse and Abbott Nutrition. On the show today, we talk about his brush with Shark Tank, his pathway to become the chief brand officer at First Watch. What is First Watch? How are they different in the restaurant category? How does the experience that they create define the concept itself. We talk a lot about culture and how culture drives both the employee experience as well as then the customer experience and much, much more. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Matt Eisenacher. Well, Matt, welcome to the show. Oh man, it's nice to be here. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Oh, I'm looking forward to talking about all things food and restaurant related <laughs> here in a few moments. <laughs> But before we get started, I hear you almost made it to Shark Tank. Uh, I have to know the story. <laughs> All right, so we're we're jumping right in then, right? We're going right into yeah, it. All right, exactly. Well, I guess I guess the first thing would be we have to define what almost means, right? This is kind of a convoluted <laughs> story, but so so I yeah, you're right. I grew up in um, in the Midwest, and we got married, and I was doing the adulting thing, and I had a house, and I started having to like rake leaves, right? And so I was out there like, you know, those brown paper, paper bags that you put leaves in. I was using yeah, those. And you, you just keep, yeah, they stink. <laughs> They're just completely, there has to be a better way. Right. And so, you know, you're bending over, picking them up. And so I was like, wow, there's gotta be a better way to do this. And I, I, I kind of came up with this open face leaf bag and I, I, I used it and kind of made some by hand. And I was like, I got to patent this. And so I'd gone through the patent process and I, to this day, I still hide this video. I, I made a how-to video and I put it online and I didn't do anything with it. I just had like this website where I was going to like try to go to Lowe's and Home Depot and, and that stuff. And somebody found it. This random person called me. It was a woman. And she said, hey, you know, I'm going to be on this TV show and it's going to be about helping entrepreneurs, you know, get their ideas off the ground. I want to help you do this. And I, I had no idea who she was. And she's like, I want to try to help you with my supply chain to get this made in China. And so for about two or three months, like we would make these prototypes and she'd send them to, to me and we'd kind of go back and forth. I'd talk to her at night. And at the end of the day, like it's just the price value because the, the, the five bags are like $1.88 and it's really difficult to do what I wanted to do for $1.88 and to be really competitive. And, right. and so we eventually put the pause on it and I'm sitting in my living room. I don't know, it was a couple, couple months later, I forget. And I'm watching this show Shark Tank and I was I loved and and all of a sudden the person I was talking to was the new shark and it was Lori Grenier and I like you sh I lost my mind on on myself <laughs> for not 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 making it happen but yeah I was I was I was working on that and I I took the patent really far and fought for it because there was some prior art against it but uh, anyway that's a long story to say I I, I did have a, a little bit of an opportunity, but didn't quite pull it over the finish line. Uh, well, I mean, it, that's close enough for me. It's closer than I've gotten, <laughs> for that matter. And no, many, I learned many, a ton. Many other people. I learned, I learned yeah. a ton, like the patent process and trying to do that yourself. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty cool once you get into it. But uh, yeah, so anyway, I, I learned a ton through the process. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, from, <laughs> from growing up in the Midwest to now being the chief brand officer at First Watch, where did you get your start in the career? You know, I got my, so I was coming out during the dot-com boom. I was coming out of college during 2000, 2001, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do, which is like something I'd, every college student out there should know. Like you, you don't need to know what you want to do coming out of college. I, but, but at that time, like I was, I was intelligent and I was motivated and there were a lot of jobs in finance and I ended up um, stumbling into an amazing opportunity at PricewaterhouseCoopers. So my, my, my beginning of my career started in finance and I worked for 
large corporations like uh, Goodyear and Kmart that were um, trying to avoid bankruptcy at the time and got to go in there and work at these companies. And I was one of very few young people. And so you got to be in part of the, all these departments. And I was in finance and I was like, man, I, I it, seen these sales and marketing people. I'm like, I want to figure out where the company's going. I don't want to measure where it's been. And right. I, I told them, I said, I want to go back and get my MBA. And they, several people told me I was making, you know, very bad decision, but, but did it anyway. And, you know, went, went and got my MBA and ended up getting into consumer packaged goods and worked for Nestle world's largest food company where I feel like it's where I started to learn kind of food and start to understand how you kind of market and position food and, and learned a ton there. And, you know, I ended up going to another CPG company, but then, then, then kind of, um, made my way into restaurants where I never thought that I would, I, I went into this restaurant brand and I was just so over the top enamored with it. Um, wasn't expecting to love it. And I reached out to someone on LinkedIn and it happened to be their CFO and just said, you know, Hey, just love what you guys are doing. Just had a couple of thoughts for you from a brand perspective. And the founder called me back the next day and I ended, ended up there and uh, spent five and a half years and, and was chief concept officer. And then um, through relationships, made my way to first watch restaurants here in Florida. And I just, I guess the one thing I would say, number one is about like me reaching out to someone on LinkedIn and it turning into one of my favorite jobs I've ever had is never be afraid to kind of reach out and take something that you're interested in and show passion. But, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to be a part of what we're doing at first watch restaurants. And I just, I love the passion and the, um, I love the energy of restaurants and the fact that you, what you do, you very quickly see, you see it with your customers so quickly, right? So you, you can have an mm -hmm. impact and see the results of what you're doing. And you go into the restaurants and you just see the person to person interaction and impact that you're having. And it's just it, restaurants are, it's a ton of fun. Yeah. I mean, just the notion of going from originally finance to CPG, you know, making that leap to the marketing and the sales side of the house, if you will. And then going from CPG to restaurants, I mean, you go from like long lead cycles, long <laughs> planning cycles from CPG to restaurants where you like literally the cash register rings every day. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's, it's intense. It's I mean, restaurants, restaurants can be an intense business, but like I said, it's, it's, it's really, it's really rewarding because especially, you know, what we do with full service, like hospitality is a very big part of what you do. And so people come to full service restaurants to, you know, recharge and connect and, you know, especially nowadays, even more so than, you know, several years ago, they, they want an experience that's going to be memorable and they're looking for really, really memorable experiences. So um, it's very rewarding. Let's talk about First Watch. Tell me a little bit about the business, the business model, how to think about it. Yeah. So First Watch, uh, we specialize in breakfast, brunch, and lunch. And unbeknownst to a lot of people, we've been around for 40 years and uh, we, uh, we specialize in, in an occasion we call daytime dining. And what that means is, you know, we're open 7 a.m. to 2.30 every single day. And we believe we differentiate ourselves through a very on-trend progressive uh, menu. So we, you know, you think of breakfast and, and you think of diners and bacon and eggs and maybe, maybe a, a, a craveable greasy spoon. Like that's kind of a lot of what, what comes to mind with breakfast people. But what we do is really positioned around fresh. So no microwaves, heat lamps or deep fryers and we change our menu five times a year. Um, so every 10 weeks, it's just a huge, huge undertaking, massive undertaking. And we put a ton into the culinary cycle of really bringing things to the menu you don't expect from breakfast and, you know, uh, flavors from around the world. And, and so, you know, we, we love specializing in breakfast and brunch. We don't think there's anyone out there doing what we're doing. And, you know, we're uh, 500, over 500 restaurants strong and in, uh, in 29, 20 sta 29 states. So. That's amazing. I mean, and it sounds like you're the the breakfast, brunch, and lunch I should be eating. <laughs> you should, yeah. Have you have you been? Have you been to a first lunch? I haven't been yet, but we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna solve that. All right. We're gonna rectify. All right, that. good. So we gotta I'm, we gotta take go. care of that and get you to a first watch. You know, actually, Alan, that's yeah. a, that's a a funny thing is that I just told you we've been around for forty years. We have five hundred restaurants, twenty nine states, and we actually know and are okay with the fact that our awareness, our brand awareness, is is actually pretty low. And we, right. we believe it's really important that, you know, we have this thing where people hear about us from a friend or a family member, and there's a word of mouth kind of a factor that, that is how people learn about us. And we're okay with that because we don't want to be known as a chain. And we go to great lengths mm -hmm. to make sure that 
when you walk into a first watch, that's your first watch and it feels a part of your community and it's different. And, you know, we resist that urge to stamp them out. And when you're opening as many as we're opening, that's, that's a really, really difficult thing, but we kind of thrive in that challenge of being the anti-chain. And so um, if you haven't been, that doesn't, that doesn't surprise me because I think there's probably a lot of people listening. They're in that same situation. Yeah. Well, hopefully we can, we can drive some more demand. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> I, I love it. Well, uh, one thing about the concept, so open from seven to two thirty. it's a limited window and I don't mean it as a negative. It's just a limited window. How do you think about driving growth with that kind of main business model constraint? So that's, uh, that's like one of the main things, the main questions that we get from people is they ask us, when are, you know, when are you going to open for dinner? And we laugh and say never, because, you know, we, we probably would do less sales if we, if we did dinner, because like, I take it back to Chick-fil-A, Chick-fil-A is not open Sundays. And I think their CEO said the same thing. Like if I open on Sundays, I probably long-term would lower my sales because you're, you're, it's, you know, when you stand for something, you specialize in something that's important. Mm-hmm. I think of other, like, like Texas Roadhouse. They're, they're amazing. They're an amazing brand that's been around for a long time. I'm pretty sure they're only open for dinner. And so for us, we think that specializing is what makes us so special. And Chris, our CEO, will always say that the secret about restaurants is they end up losing money on the shoulder periods, you know, time between lunch and dinner. And those are the times that we let our employees, you know, clean up the restaurant and go home. So we have a saying mm-hmm. that's out the door by four. And if you're not out the door by four, we, we want to, we want to know, and we want to figure out how we can help you do that. So we get a very, very high caliber of employee and team member because you think about those that are willing to wake up that early in the morning. And, and we think we, we are able to attract a higher caliber of employee. And in today's world where it's a fight for talent and you know people might be a little more transient, we think that quality of life and the fact that you can be home to you know, make did dinner for your, your family, get the kids off the school bus. Some people do have uh, you know, you know, hobbies that they, they, they want to have more time to do. And now they know when they're going to be home every night and they don't have to worry about a night shift. Yeah. No, it's a, it sounds like, a, I mean, it sounds fantastic from an employee standpoint. To your point around specialization, making sure you're really good at the thing you're doing, yeah. um, and, you know, not spreading yourself too thin. Getting back to restaurants, though, and, and this notion, like they are an experienced business. It's food, it's people, the environment. How are you thinking about the experience that you're creating for at a First Watch? We think of First Watch as a, as a gathering place. Like when you think of, I don't know, Alan, think like five years ago before... COVID and think of the place, like if you wanted to go meet someone where you would go, um, there are fewer of those places now. And there's, you know, of course we do digital ordering and all that kind of stuff. That that's a big part of what we do, but like a lot of places have really succumbed to that where you've forgotten about the human experience and the fact that people will need a place to mm-hmm. gather and place to connect. And so f- for us, we think intensely about the comfort of our restaurants the, a lot of, if, 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 you know, you go into a first watch, hopefully you feel the comfort and the, the materials that we use, the things we do feel like what you'd find in your home, not mm-hmm. like what you'd find in a restaurant often. And we don't, I, I, we, our team, all of us really strive. Like you never want it to feel like you're being marketed to. You just want it to feel like a place that you can sit with a friend, turn off your phone. Maybe it's two people that just finished yoga that want to go sit down and have a conversation and connect. That's exactly what we're there for. Or someone who's retired, that's going to you know start on their ritual on their Wednesday morning breakfast. We'd love to have you or a professional. Now we see this more that like, instead of having a meeting to kick off your day in an office, you meet mm-hmm. at a first watch. And so the materials, the comfort, the environment has to just feel like a place to, to connect. No, uh, I mean, I, I love it. I've, Definitely got to get there. <laughs> I'm going to get you there soon. I got to, I got to, that's going to be my job coming out of this. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it just sounds fantastic because uh, there aren't that many places to, to your point. Like I think is uh, maybe it's a downfall of coming out of the COVID period of life, but you, a lot of restaurants have gotten smaller and, you know, less, you know, it's more about getting you out the door versus keeping you in the door. Yeah. There's um, this like, there's so this weird, um, at least what I've seen, there's this weird polarization where like those that are making convenience better are, are winning and those that are making the experiences more special are winning. So it's kind of like pushing out on both dimensions. And 
you know, you see that from the full service brands that are winning, that they, they focus on hospitality, they focus on the basics, they focus on smiles and, you know, pr- you know, you're getting your order to the table fast and smile, all, all of those things that are, it may not be the sexy things that you, everyone wants to talk about because they want to talk about AI and chat GPT and all, you know, all, all the robots, all the, all those things. But my point is you have to know, you know, what your value proposition is and places like Chipotle, I love, but you know, they're there for convenience and taking seconds and clicks out. And, and that is a value to me and my family, you know, we use them a lot, but you don't want to get caught yeah. in the muddy middle. Like there's other full service brands out there that have failed to evolve because they kind of want to live in this convenience world, but then they try to, you know, they want to do hospitality. It's just, you gotta, you gotta really figure out where your true North is. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Well, I mean, to deliver the type of experience and the environment that you're talking about, I mean, it has to take culture, right? And we talked a little bit about culture the first time we talked. How do you think about culture and how, what role it plays in achieving what you're trying to do? Well, just as you asked that question, and I'm, I'm not kidding you, I, I got chills because I just left our um, company conference last, last uh, week. And 800, every manager of all of our restaurants come to one place. And the whole, the whole conference is about culture and connection. And I left there realizing what a special place First Watch is. But to answer your question directly, we've been around for 40 years. And you know, we're very lucky to have a founder that saw that. So what we call our culture is it's you first. And what that means is you focus on the employee. And the employee then focuses on the customer, which sometimes might, it, it seems simple, but like a lot of times you hear the customer's always right. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but what I'm saying <laughs> is that for Ken, our founder, his point was like, if you, if you really focus on the whole employee and making them happy, the rest falls into place. And you just, you know, when I was at this conference last week, like you see this in spades that everything that we do, we try to figure out how to make the employee's job more rewarding or easier, you know, and, and, and a great example of this is in our, our HR team does this. It's, it's, it's amazing. We, if we do what it's called the Y tour and it's, it's short for the, we hear you tour. And in a world where growing organizations, um, there's lots of examples out, out there right now about this, that they're getting more disconnected from those that are on the front lines. Our yeah. Y tour is about taking some of our most senior executives, so CEO, chief people officer, head of operations, and they get on, it's 29 different tours for an hour and a half each. And they talk directly with hourly employees without any managers on the call. And this is a, I can tell you, it's an enormous time commitment, but it is one of the most important things that we do because we hear about the things that are affecting frontline team members who are the most important ones because they're, they're focusing on the customer that's walking in the door, you know, we're making decisions at several points removed, but like we hear things that, that a great example is <laughs> we, we had, we recently put these screens in our kitchens, mm. k- kitchen display screens, instead of working off of paper tickets. And one of the cooks said it was really hard. There were certain color combinations that made it really hard in the kitchen that when they were busy to read the orders, he said, can you change the colors during the call? Our CEO was texting someone at head of technology and and said, can we change this for tomorrow morning? And he came back and said, you know what? You're right. It'll be changed tomorrow morning when you go in the restaurant. And so the point is like, <laughs> you have, you have these team members who are, who are working with your customers every day. And when they know that you're focused on understanding what they need, they're, they're rejuvenated. They know they're being heard. And then they're more excited about them focusing on the customer. So that that's how we describe our culture. I love it. I love it. I mean, it seems like a great well, one. It, you're, you're reactive. You, you, listening, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, you're caring, like caring comes through just that notion and the story you told about the changing of the screen colors. I mean, that, and the responsiveness. I mean, the fact that you be able to turn that around so quickly, that's amazing. Um, I can see why people want to look. Yeah. No, I was going to say like, it's many of these things aren't, they aren't big issues. They're things that right. they, you know, you don't want it to have to go through many levels to get passed through because someone's going to say, Oh, it's, you know, it's just a color on a screen, but for the, those cooks, like it's, that's, that's affecting their daily role. And so it's, it's important to stay connected. That's the main message. Yeah, no, I love it. I love it. Well, so, I mean, you're the chief brand officer. How do you think about marketing and like your go to market and activities that you're doing in the context of the experience you're trying to deliver? 
and the culture of the organization. So like, how do you, Mm -hmm. what does marketing look like? Yeah. So, you know, it's different in the role that I'm in now because I've been in consumer product goods. Um, I've been in um, fast casual restaurants and the focus of those restaurants, usually marketing is a little bit more the tip of the spear. What I, what I think of in the role that I'm in today is my job is to influence and almost be able to infuse brand in all parts of the organization without people even knowing it. So when I think of like first watch, like we have, we're, we're opening, you know, let's just say for round numbers, we're opening like 50 a year. Like we're the fastest full service brand in the nation, several years running. And that like, Opening 50 restaurants, full service restaurants is a monumental task. These are complicated builds, complicated kitchens, a lot of employees. There's a lot going on there. And so my relationship with our head of development, construction, and restaurant design is really, really important because, you know, it's not about marketing. Like I just told you before, like, I don't want you to walk in our dining rooms and feel like you're being marketed to, but the certain touches of materials, the certain feel and the vibe in the restaurant, you know, is very important. So, so it, it, influencing and being a part of that is important. Then you know, Shane, the chef Shane is our head of culinary. And I, you know, I talked to you about the fact that we change our menu five times a year. That's equally as daunting as opening 50 restaurants, but being able to create those relationships and him and I, to be able to understand the, the menus that are going to roll through and the trends we're focused on. And, you know, right now beverage is a, is a really big hot topic right now. And, and so we spend a lot of time on beverage and it's really about being able to first put the team first and the experience first and find ways to infuse brand and that, that consistent brand promise and everything that we do versus trying to say it's about marketing and, and trying to, to make sure that you're, you have some marketing messages you're trying to push on your customers when they walk in the door. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, and you're such an experienced product too. I mean, like, I have to believe that like just getting people to recognize you in the markets where you're open in particular, I guess, where you're opening and just discover you has got to be kind of like once, once the, the build is done, that's the next challenge I'm guessing. Yeah. I mean, so we, you know, don't, don't get me wrong. There, there's a lot of what we do to drive demand to our restaurants, but our focus is on doing that in kind of a quiet organic way. So, you know, now it's easier because you have digital channels that, you know, allow you to be a lot more targeted. You know, we know the type of customer we're seeking. So we don't have to shout from the rooftops to everyone. We're very targeted about who we try and speak to. We're a very food forward brand. So that tells us the type of customer that we have to go after. You know, influencers are a big part of what we do because again, then you, then you feel like you're hearing it from someone else versus, you know, some paid advertisement that we're pushing to you. You know, we, mm-hmm. we've won countless breakfast and brunch awards, you know, and, and, and we always focus on, you know, trying to, to make sure that we show up well and in, in those places as well. So it's, it's about like, um, finding the most organic ways for people to, to learn and hear about us. And, you know, if you don't, if you don't follow us on Instagram, Alan, I'd, 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 I'd really suggest it because I think you'll get a sense, <laughs> I think you get a sense for what we do. Like, you know, we're, we, we very much try to focus on the, the, the food and the experience and, and make sure that, that, um, you don't feel like you're being marketed to, but we try to really entertain and educate. Yeah, no, it, it, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. And I mean, like the notion of influencers and kind of that, the, like the awards that you were mentioning too, like that third party endorsement and just press, frankly, like getting people to talk about you, whether they're notable or not. Yeah. Uh, that word of mouth is needed. Yeah. And the other thing I'll tell you, I, I think about a lot is technology's obviously become a big part of every, every brand, every restaurant brand. And, and, you know, we invest in it like everyone else, but like for us, technology is still an enablement of hospitality. And so, so my, what I was on my mind a lot is how do we, how do we try to use customer behavior and, and putting that in the hands of our team members so that, you know, if someone walks in and, and let's just say that's a, a loyal customer who may not come to your restaurant a lot, but they come to a lot of first watches and they know who we are. And there's certain things we know about it. Like put that in the hands of your, of your team members. So they have the ability to personalize the experience and make sure that they, uh, they, they don't just make it as another restaurant visit that they can really make it special. I love that. I love that. 
Well, I have, like we've been talking about, I got to get to first watch. (laughs) So that's, that's on my to-do list (laughs) uh, as well as follow the Instagram account because I'm a foodie myself. So probably going to be, go down the rabbit hole there, I'm sure. Nice. But uh, one of the things I'd love to switch gears, like one of the things we'd love to do on the show is also to get to know you a little bit better. We know you have a, an appetite for an inventive streak, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and hate those leaf bags, which I, it's now leaf season. One day I'm going to figure it out, man. I'm, I still, to this I, day, I'm going to figure know. out how to make that work. <laughs> I feel like I, I finally nailed something that last year. Uh, and this may be like old school technique, but like I just now lay down a tarp and uh and rake the leaves onto the tarp so i'm not like trying to aim for anything and then i i make my daughter drag it to the street with me <laughs> and the town luckily that i live in they'll come around and suck them up like oh. i don't have to bag them anymore which is amazing see that's so. that's nirvana right there mine was all about it was basically uh, a tarp bag you rake it on the tarp and it yeah. just folds up and put it at the curb in, in, a, in a paper bag so that's yeah. you, you live in, a, in an awesome place then if they're going to come get it for you yeah, well, the taxes hurt pretty bad. So. <laughs> <laughs> Pluses and minuses. Pluses and minuses. But uh, but anyway, back to you. Uh, my favorite question to ask everybody that comes on the show is, is there an experience of your past that defines or makes up who you are today? You know, it's, I don't, this isn't a very sexy answer, but I worked a lot when I was young. When I, you know, when I got when I was in high school and even in college, like I was, uh, so I was the youngest of three boys. My parents always had this rule that, you know, my brothers had to always play a sport and I wasn't Mm. like super athletic. Like I played rec things, but I wasn't super athletic, but I was, I was pretty smart and did well in school. I think my parents were tired by that time. They didn't make me pick up a sport. (laughs) So I, I actually, like when I first turned, uh, well, I, I was actually 15 at the time. I started like working. I saw, so as soon as I would leave school, I would go directly to work and I worked at a grocery store and, and I took a lot of pride in it and, and I really enjoyed it. And I, I, I moved up there pretty quickly. And then I kind of then moved and I was a server and I worked at a, an American Eagle at the same time. And then I, I cut grass on, on golf course. I, so anyway, the, the jobs aren't important, but like there was a thing about like when I was really young that I really started taking pride and working and and seeing the results of the things that I did. And I think to this day, it's made an impact on who I am and how I approach my job that, you know, I like to have my fingers in the dirt. I want to get in there and, and do things with everybody else. And I, I, I you know, I, I just find that the, um, the mentality of like wanting to work and get things done has really permeated kind of my style. I mean, I, it's funny thing is our CEO, Chris, he's actually my next door neighbor. And, he always makes fun of me because I'm, I have this, like, I have all this landscaping outside. It's, it's really crazy how much time it takes. And he's always like, why don't you get someone to help you? And I'm like, I don't know, man, I take a lot. I, I enjoy it. I take a lot of pride in it. And so I, I think, um, you know, you don't see many young people kind of pick up jobs that early anymore. You know, there's, there's so many other things going on and distractions early on, but there's a value in, in taking pride and, and, and learning how to work. So. I love that. I mean, I, like yourself, like I, I did have one sport. I, I was a wrestler, but I was, I was okay. I was okay. That's tough, man. But, That's a tough uh, one. That is a tough one. It is a tough one. The thing that sticks with you is the cutting weight part of it, um, <laughs> which I hope they fix soon. Like that's, that's the, there's nothing like angry teenage boys because they're hungry. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to turn that way. I'm going to turn this back on you then. I got to know, like, what was the most extreme thing you did to cut weight? Oh, I probably shouldn't say this out loud, but I will. Like, I mean, we we used to turn the heat up in the workout room to like 80 or however high it would go, 80, 85, and then wear a trash bag under our sweats to like sweat out all our body weight. The most unhealthy, Mm. and I should say this out loud to anybody listening, do not do that. Mm. (laughs) It's not not healthy, not the right thing for you. But what I think I think some of the college athletes probably still do some things like that to cut weight. But um but yeah, but I, I worked too. When I wasn't wrestling, I was working and, you know, in the outside of school. And I agree with you. I mean, I think there's something about like working at an learning work ethic mm-hmm. at an early age mm-hmm. has a dramatic impact on people. So I like your story. It may not be sexy, but it's a good one. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, like, it's just, I learned like feedback and I, I said, I, I did pretty well when I was working and so you'd move up and that's like, that, that's like pride. You learn pride and you're like, okay, 
how do I, how do I do more to try and get that, that right. feeling again? And I just think that's, um, we shouldn't overlook that. And I, I think about that a lot of when, you know, with my kids. Yeah. Well, the, the one thing you said that I'm not going to touch, but your CEO is your next door neighbor. That's pretty close. That's pretty close. <laughs> There's a whole All story right. there, but he, <laughs> I should say like he was very kind when I moved here and he let me be his neighbor. So yeah, it's pretty funny. That's, that's pretty funny. That is pretty funny. Anyway, moving on. Okay. What advice would you give your younger self if you're starting this journey all over? Oh man. What would it, wow. Wild ride. I don't know. The, the, the power, it, actually we might talk more about this, but, um, the power of, of focus and patience. And I say that more of like the world we live in now, like is, is, is a marketer. Like it's, so I, I've been doing this for enough time that things have become a whole lot busier, splintered. You wake up, you know, each morning to texts of what changed and you got to react to it. And I do think that like becoming like not being a prisoner to the moment, like don't, you have to be fast. You have to be fast. You have to move on things. We have good examples of that, but like being able to take a breath and say, you know, is this the right thing to follow? Is this the right thing for my team? Is this the right thing for the brand? It's something that I'm like, I'm very focused on right now. And I, I think, it, you know, I, I would guess a lot of people in this industry are, are focused on as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's truly hard to turn off the noise <laughs> because it, much of it is noise and trying to figure out what you should pay attention to. So kudos on trying to do that. Yeah. Well, is there a topic you think marketers need to be learning more about, or, or maybe it's something you're trying to learn more about yourself? Right. The biggest thing I would say is, is related to kind of how the environment has changed that 10 years ago, maybe more than that, like you were focused on like finding the marketing idea and then, you know, crystallizing that idea and then kind of pushing it out through all the channels. Like, I don't know if you remember like the 360 degree marketing plan and, you know, it was about the idea and you put, you know, there's like four or five channels and you're pushing it out through all that. Now there's, I'm not going to belabor the point that how many different touch points and from influence, like just take, just take influencers and social media just by itself. Like right. that's, it's, it's, it's crazy. And so my, my answer to you is like, you have to have so many different specialists for all of these different areas because they're so deep and to really understand and get the most out of them, you need people that live them. And so then mm -hmm. thinking about how teams come together in a very unstructured way is important. So my team at times, I'm, I know I drive them crazy because like, if you want like standard lines for how everything goes and communication and reporting relationships, like it's just, if you do that, you're going to become a dinosaur and you're going to fall behind because every day, depending on the thing that you're working on or the thing you're solving, it might, it might involve three or five or seven different specialists. And it all depends on, it's like a different elixir, what it takes. And right. so like, I just, I think of like these unstructured teams that allow people to have the satisfaction and ownership of knowing that they're the expert in their area, but coming together in a, a humble way to solve different problems. And sometimes you might be the one leading it and sometimes you may not because it's all just different challenges. And so I just, I think of marketing teams now as just being these like fluid, flexible organizations. And um, it's, it's really interesting to me. And it's, it's, it's really, it's a really interesting challenge. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I like the construct that you're describing. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely required in some respects today and, and not all organizations have cracked it. So, I mean, maybe it's a topic we can, we can talk about more later in another time, because I'd love to see, you know, how your, how your structure, how do they work? Right. It's not dissimilar from kind of a consulting model where you pull project teams together mm -hmm. around a common mission or a common task. Right. And then they, they disband once the task is over and you reconstitute new teams every time there's kind of a new objective to, to, to make. Is that yeah, roughly I, I, kind of I how you're thought thinking about, about it like that? Like, you yeah. know, I'll, I'll give you an example. Like yeah. 2021 was a notorious difficult period for the restaurant industry in terms of employment and convincing mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. to come to work. And I remember our HR team was, coming, you know, to us and saying, Hey, we, we need help. We need to show people why they'd want to work at first watch. And, you know, it was just, it was a really interesting challenge. And 
So, you know, we took several people from our team and several people from their team. And, and it's really cool what they ended up doing. I, I won't go through it here, but again, to your point about like kind of consulting, it was like a unique challenge that there were several people on our team that like never, they had, they had no idea about employment and t- talent acquisition and things like that. Right. But you had those experts on the team. And so they kind of came together in this really cool way and did some great things and had some great results. So I think, I think your example is spot on. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, got two more questions for you. Are there any trends or subcultures that you're following you think other people should take notice of? I don't know if I'd label it as a subculture, but I am genuinely way over the top interested in Gen Z. And I know we do this mm-hmm. with all generations, like, you know, millennials were <laughs> <laughs> supposed to like just change, change the world. And, and, and they, they actually, you know, it did and how much change there was. But like, I still think we underestimate this generation now that by the way is, is entering into their earning years for the first time. So I, if, if I have my facts right, I think they're coming into like 23, 24 years old or the older Gen Z. And, you know, they lived through the financial crisis of 2008, 2010. So they, they witnessed their parents kind of struggle mm-hmm. through that. And then by the way, they were quarantined and saw the impacts of technology. <laughs> and they don't, and they don't know anything but technology like my, so I'm 44 years old. I got a cell phone in college. So I know a world where I was tethered to the wall with a coiled cord on a rotary phone trying to, you know, in a closet talking about Like I know that. So I have this kind of (laughs) like different view both ways. They don't. And I just, so I think the change, we think we've seen a lot of change and we have over the past few years. But I think as that generation gets older, the amount of change that we're going to see, like we've only seen a little bit of it. And I'm really, really focused on learning about that generation and the trends that might come with it. Because I I just think that, you know, you don't see a lot of that until they get into closer to their thirties as they're starting to think about families or, or maybe not because they're, they're really not thinking about families, but anyway, you get my point. Right. Yeah, no, I get, I get it. I agree. It is a, it's an interesting dynamic more to watch as it relates to how they, how they become full full adults, if you will. Yeah. A lot to watch. But well, last, last question for you. What, what do you feel like is the largest opportunity or threat facing marketers today? Burnout. I, you know, <laughs> you go back, no, I mean, I'm being That's serious. Like going back, going back yeah. to that, that theme of, I'll give you an example. Last Sunday, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this because our lawyers put like fear in me, but like we, uh, <laughs> we, I was sitting a week and a half ago and I was sitting on my couch on a Sunday and uh, Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift ordered from a, one of our restaurants and somebody picked mm-hmm. it up and wrote about it. And, you know, I see it and we jump on it and the team's all on it. And it's a Sunday afternoon and you're kind of running hard at it and you run hard at it until Monday. And what are you going to do with this all that? And so it's a, it's a good example of like what we were talking about earlier of the what's going on in the moment, what do you jump on and what do you not? And I think there's so much of that, that you have to be careful that, when I interview marketers now, I so rarely see people that are in their positions for a long period of time. And right. there's, a, there's yeah. implications to that. Like you should, I believe that a good marketer should be in their role and see the implications of their actions. Because you, if you have to live with your action or live with your results, you do your, you know, different things, but there's so few people that do that. And, and I think the reason you don't see a lot of that is organizations ask so much of marketers, almost like you're magicians at times, like, Hey, you know, we want this to happen on this day. And, you know, it's like, it doesn't happen like that. And I think we have to, as marketing leaders, we have to think about, yes, how to stay nimble. Yes. How to move with what's happening in the moment, but to create an environment where your teams don't feel like they're just going through a meat grinder all the time. And I think it takes a lot of like planning to like, yes, you're going to plan out further, but they're going to be unique ideas. And I might, there's this brand designer on my team who said something to me the other day, it hit me really hard. It sat with me. And he said, he, he's a guy that designs a lot of the social media posts, like the reels and TikToks mm-hmm. that, that we do. And he said, no, I, I really get a lot of satisfaction from creating unique things. But what's happened in social media in the world right now is that everybody's doing the same thing. So there's a meme that hits and everybody (laughs) jumps on that same meme. And he's like, it's so unrewarding to me as a designer because I'm not doing anything unique. I'm following what everyone else is doing. And like hit with me. I was like, wow, like that is so well said. And I think you're going to see 
a kickback to what we've seen over the past two years with TikTok, where you know everything's meme driven. Where I think people that have unique ideas and unique perspectives are are going to be rewarded. I hope that that comes to life. <laughs> me, too. me too. I'm with you. <laughs> yes, I do. And I, but the burnout you're talking about is real. Like I I hear it and I see it everywhere I go. And yeah, it's it's tough. But but you have to jump on those Taylor and Travis moments. I mean, <laughs> the, the NFL by themselves are like skyrocketing because of that. Yeah. But I, I, whether you like Taylor or you don't like Taylor. She's a force. She is a force. I mean, would you would you argue with the fact that she's she's got to be like the most? I mean, she's the biggest celebrity in the world, right? I mean, can you think of anyone bigger right now? Yeah, no, (laughs) no, not no. (laughs) I I cannot think of anyone bigger. And I mean, she moves markets literally, like uh, local markets with concerts. I mean, and she's a brilliant marketer. I don't know if she's coming up with all her her stuff herself, but like. The the whole launching a filmed version of her concerts. I mean, like how about her unique model? songs, Brilliant. like you, you, the the album that she launched, which was her originals, like this, you know, that like and she did it. I'm like, wow, that's oh, yeah. just like so incredibly smart. And uh, yeah, she's she is a great marketer. Yeah, she is, and, and just a phenomenal business person. Like just very astute, very astute. Mm-hmm. She should teach MBA classes. <laughs> and my, you know what the time. cool thing about it is my so. I, I have young girl, I have two young girls and they all look up to her and you look out and you say, man, that's, that's a good role model. Like it's someone that they can look up to that's doing mm-hmm. things the right way. And going back to our point about work ethic, like that's, it's, it's, she's, she's a good role model for, for kids. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now I just want her to keep a boyfriend. You know? like just, <laughs> that's, that's the one thing. And I'm sure her mom would say the same thing. That's the one thing I really want you to try to work on. Uh, <laughs> like, it's funny. But then what would she write songs about? I didn't yeah, no you need the pain. You the need the pain into your lyrics. Like, yeah, so that's, yeah, it benefits all yeah, of us, exactly. I guess, in some weird way. Yeah, some weird way. Well, uh, <laughs> well, Matt, it's not every day I get to talk about Taylor Swift. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for coming on the show. I really enjoyed the conversation and I you will see me at a first watch. Very all soon. right. Tell me all about it. I want you to send me pictures and tell me how we did. All right. I will do. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with post-production support from Sam Robertson. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe on marketingtodaypodcast.com. Tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love hearing from listeners. You can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you'll also find complete show notes and links to what was discussed in the episode today, and you can search our archives. I'm Alan Hart.